Greetings to you all in the blessed name of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's indeed a joy to see you all this morning. Special word of welcome to all those who are worshipping with us online as well. As we focus on the cross today, especially on the seven sayings of Jesus Christ on the cross, let us fight on our hearts in prayer as we begin this worship service. Isaiah 53 He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it were our faces from him he was despised and we did not esteem him surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Master, for sending your only begotten Son into this world, who was born into this world to die on the cross. And here we are, your people, chosen by your love, gathered as KMC family. Come before your throne of grace to focus on the cross, to remember all those things that happened on the day of crucifixion. As Isaiah prophesied, it was fulfilled 2,000 years ago. Today we are here to meditate on seven words on the cross. To know your heart, to know your mind. To sing your praises for all that you have done on the cross. To offer ourselves as an offering to you. To go out of this sanctuary transformed in heart and mind. So that we may proclaim your gospel into this world. We commend all of us into thy hands. Let your name be glorified. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Shall we all rise up and sing 228? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross.
As we remain standing, let us read responsively from Isaiah 53, 1 to 12, entitled The Suffering Servant. Who has believed what we have heard? For he grew up before him like a young plant. He had no form or comeliness that we should look at him. And no 
beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men. And his sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet he is deemed and stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was chastisement that made us whole, and, and with, with his stripes we are healed. healed. Part 2. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And as the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all, us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that is before the shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. And they made his grave with the wicked. And with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him, and he has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, he shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, Make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death. He was numbered in his transgressions. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. be seated. We shall continue to worship the Lord by offering our prayers. As the music is played, I request those of you who would like to come to the altar for prayers, you're welcome. And I request Reverend John to please come forward and lead us in the pastoral prayer. Jesus said, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrows to the point of death. Going a little further, he fell 
with his face to the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, on this day, more than 2,000 years back, Lord, you sent your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to fulfill the law, to fulfill the plan, and make your purpose come true. Lord, Lord, you loved your children, you loved the world, that Lord, you gave your only begotten Son. And Lord, there is a purpose, that Father, so that everyone who believes on him will receive the eternal life. Loving Heavenly Father, we cannot measure your love. Lord, even though, Father, we give all our life to you, still it is nothing in front of your great and your abundant love and sacrifice. Master, on that day when our Lord Jesus Christ was overwhelmed with the sorrows to the point of death and Lord he prayed and we can understand we can understand the sorrow that how much he is going yes the Lord it is terrible one O oh, mighty Father, even then, O oh Lord, even then, O oh Father, even your Son is going into that terrible and a shameful act. Lord, you did not turn from what you have planned. Lord, even then, O oh Father, your love for your children your love for us, your love for me, never came down. And Lord, as Isaiah prophesied to the Lord, Lord, he bore our iniquities. He did for our sins, O oh Lord. Lord, he was beaten, smitten, and Lord, he undergone all kind of shame. To the shame that he became naked for us. O oh Lord, we cannot imagine, O oh Father. Lord, that much pain your Son, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, has undergone only because he wants to save us. Only because you have a plan to save to reconcile. You want us to come back to you and only because of that, Lord. And Lord, we call this day as a Good Friday. Yes, Lord, you have taken away all our sins on that cross. And Lord, you have made righteous in your Son. And Lord, with his greatest sacrifice, Standing here victorious, praising your name and glorifying your name, O Lord. But still, Lord, we remember his pain and agony, Lord. Yes, O mighty Father, help us to remember. Help us to remember the way, the pain, the agony that he went, Lord. Yes, O Master, today, O Father, we come. We come with a humble heart and, Lord, tears in our eyes, O Master. Forgive us, O Lord, 
accept us o oh lord you are the compassionate lord father almighty i commit the rest of this service unto your holy hands to oh father all those who have come here lord they have come with a burden lord not because they are willing but lord it is your plan lord not because they wanted but you wanted them to come here lord yes oh father they are here oh lord your children oh father lord anoint them each lord bless them and lord speak to them personally today oh father as lord as you have appointed the pastors and the laymen the laywomen here oh lord to speak your last words on the cross lord and lord we pray that lord you bestow your message your instruction in your words upon them oh lord and lord let them speak confidently oh lord the words that lord you wanted us to know oh lord Yes, O oh Father, we give glory to you, O oh Lord. You are speaking to us, O oh Lord. Mighty Father, your Holy Spirit is in our midst. And Lord, we know that, Lord, it will convict each one of us. And it will instruct and comfort us, Lord, today, O oh Master. Lord, we give glory to your Father. And Lord, we commit everyone who have come here, Lord bless them to a father and give them good health Lord and protect them from all the harm and all the danger Lord and let not anyone fall sick here today O father as they are going to sit for another 3 hours here Lord Lord we commit all the electronic and technical gadgets and everything Lord the media Lord and Lord as we are live stream today O father and the people are as they are watching of oh father and let them also receive you today of oh father and let them receive your words and lord bless them to of oh father thank you for listening to us oh lord lord we continue to pray oh lord continue to pray for all the churches all the services that are happening today oh lord lord in different ways and in different kind oh lord lord wherever it may be oh father we pray that lord Lord let your mighty angels surround them and protect them oh father we know that lord the enemy is active lord and lord he want to destruct your services lord lord he want to destroy your name oh father you want to destroy your children oh lord but we know that lord you have already overcome lord and lord he doesn't have any strength or any energy but lord we pray that lord let your angels protect them to oh father lord Lord, let all the churches and all the services all the pastors all the evangelists and all those who are taking your name today oh father all those who are coming in your name oh lord bless them to oh father lord as it may be in karnataka it may be in the states of india lord it may be in the other in the country and in the other world lord in the different in the countries of this world to oh father lord in everywhere in every corner oh lord let your presence move father and let your name be glorified through this service to our father committing ourselves oh lord committing the rest of the worship and committing the choir and committing all those who are bringing praise and worship today oh father committing all those who are singing your melodious songs to our father and committing all those who have come to the altar oh lord bless them and use them to our father Lord committing ourselves our pastors and all the speakers of today oh lord may your name be glorified through this service oh lord i pray this prayer in the mighty name of our lord and savior jesus christ who taught us to pray while we pray our father who art in heaven the lord be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil and is the kingdom the power and the glory from the earth
Some seats are even uh, available in front. Uh, you can send here. For the first word that Lord uttered on the cross, the scripture is chosen from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses from 26 to 38. Luke 23, verses 26 to 38. I will be reading for you from NIV version. Here it says, As they led him away, they seized Simon from uh, Sidon, who was on his way in from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women, women and uh, who moaned and wa wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourself and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the women and the wombs that never bore and the breeze that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountain, Fallen us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if men do these things, when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there were crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. Here ends the reading. May God add his abundant blessing on the reading. And over to Pastor Navin to bring the first word that Lord our God uttered on the cross. Let us pray. King of kings and Lord of lords, the one who came willingly into this world to be born like one of us, suffered like one of us, died like one of us, and resurrected as King of kings and Lord of lords. There is none like you, Lord. There is none like you. As we meditate on those words that you uttered on the cross, we pray let your Holy Spirit be amongst us. Speak to us to the point of our needs. Those who have gathered as KMC family, none of us are perfect. We need to hear your still small voice. We need your ministry. We need your touch. Anoint each one of us as speakers so that your name be glorified, your heart be revealed. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen. Jesus spoke seven short but significant sentences from the cross which together throws light on the cross. It's interesting to note that no one evangelist records all the seven words. Matthew and Mark preserve only one, which is the fifth word, the cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
while remaining six words, Luke records three, John records three. The church has cherished this so-called seven words from the cross as disclosing the thoughts of Jesus on the cross. As we will see, each is an expression either of his great love for us or of his dreadful work of sin bearing or for his final triumph or victory. The first word which is written down by Luke chapter 23 verse 34. Then Jesus said, Father forgive them for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. As we all know from this prayer, it is the prayer for the executioners. He is praying for Jewish leaders who rejected him as Messiah. In answer to this prayer, they were granted 40 years of reprieve during which thousands repented and believed in Jesus. Only in 70 AD did the judgment of God fell upon the nation of Israel when Jerusalem was taken and its temple destroyed. It's a powerful one sentence prayer. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. This word, the first word on the cross is a prayer for forgiveness for those who were instrumental in crucifying Jesus. Opposite of forgiveness is resentment or revenge. As I was looking into the dictionary, opposite of the action of forgiving, there are 56 verbs that Jesus could have chosen to pray for, for his executioners. 56 options he had. But out of 56 options, he chose one which is opposite to that 56 options and it was forgiveness. He could have punished, he could have charged, he could have penalized, he could have brought judgment, he could have reprimanded, he could have convicted, etc. 56 options. But on the cross, the first thing he did was to pray to the Father and say, Father, forgive them. Why? His forgiving spirit is the spirit of forgiveness more powerful for than all these 56 options that we find in the dictionary. Let us see how that affects the church, how that affects the disciple of Jesus Christ. We did an amazing study on the book of Acts last year. There is a wonderful revelation in that book of Acts that we all need to know as a church. The church needs to absorb this important fact to the core. The tradition of forgiveness is flown into the DNA of the New Testament church. And that is, there is an amazing um, absence of resentment or revenge among the early Christians. It starts with Stephen in Acts 7, 60, where he repeats the same prayer as Jesus does. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, it says he fell asleep. The one book which is written down in the human history without resentment or revenge is the book of Acts. 
it is very interesting in the pages of the book of acts there isn't one single syllable of revenge or asking god to deal harshly or even justly with enemies the book of acts is the most retaliation absent account that has ever been written for it depicts a society of which all except love has been eliminated and this is the history that you and i are part of the history of the early church with regard to forgiveness as we look into the word we see that unforgiveness is violence only forgiveness can break the cycle of violence jesus broke the cycle of violence by forgiving his enemies the violence of unforgiveness is been spoken by jesus himself in the gospel of matthew chapter 6 verse 12 to 15 in the lord's prayer but if you do not forgive men their sins your father will not forgive your sins just above this 15th verse is the verse that we all pray every day on every occasion whether corporately or individually forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors unforgiveness is a violence according to the word one that we do both to ourselves and also to the one on whom we refuse to forgive jesus's message is that refusing to forgive will in fact kill you body soul and spirit and that is the truth about forgiveness as we see the book of acts a society of no inner hurts jesus did not meet a wrong with the wrong come with me to luke chapter 9 verse 51 to 56 it is about a samaritan village rejecting jesus and it is very interesting to note that in luke 9 we see the early revelation of forgiveness and how jesus disciples understood forgiveness when we read this passage from luke 9 we see the spirit of revenge this spirit of revenge is seen when the disciple asked jesus if they should call down the fire from heaven on that samaritan village which has refused to allow jesus to enter because jesus's face was set towards jerusalem the samaritans were wrong in their fierce prejudice against anyone going to jerusalem that was race prejudice and it was pure and simple but the disciples were also wrong in answering a wrong with the wrong they tried to soften that wrong and give it a religious flavor by saying it would be from heaven therefore with the divine sanction upon it and they quote elijah to sanction from the prophet the old prophets from the old testament even disciples were learning how powerful was forgiveness so the spirit of tit for tat was still in religion up until the coming of the holy spirit and we are the holy spirit new testament church in the new testament when the holy spirit arrived the attitude of revenge and resentment died out in the fires of burning love for everybody even the enemies and we have this tradition as the church of jesus christ what was before 
Old Testament came into existence. Before Old Testament came into existence, revenge was unlimited. If a man knocked down one of your eyes, you could go to him and remove two of his eyes plus his life. And that was before the Old Testament came into existence. When the OT came, the revenge became limited. The revenge became one eye for one eye. An eye for an eye. But when the New Testament came, when Jesus arrived on this planet Earth, Jesus abolished revenge totally. Evil was to be overcome with the good. So Jesus was demonstrating, don't meet wrong with the wrong. As we continue to meditate on the first word of Jesus, we could see three levels of life and then decide which one you and I are going to live on. The first level of life where you return evil for good. That is demonic level of life. Evil for good. And we are seeing that happening in the world around us. And the second level of life is a level where you return evil for evil. That is human level of life. And the third level of life is the level where you return good for evil. A Christian level, a divine level. You become born to the qualities you give out. If you give evil for good, then you become evil. You become the thing you give out. If you give evil for evil, you will become a tit for tat person, legalistic, unlovely and unloved. If you give out good for evil, then you are born of the good and you become good. You may say, Pastor, it is good to say on the pulpit, but the person is undeserving for that goodness that I want to offer him. That doesn't matter. For Jesus, it didn't matter. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That doesn't matter if you give out love to an undeserving person. It will be a bright spot to him on his way to hell. It will be a bright spot to you as well for there you have risen to a divine level of life. And that is what Jesus expects us as we meditate on this first word on the cross. Someone once spoke to Abraham Lincoln that he had forgiven an enemy. To that, Lincoln replied, our business is to get rid of our enemies, isn't it? Well, I got rid of this one by turning him into a friend through forgiveness. The only possible way to get rid of an enemy is to turn him into a friend. And the only possible way to turn him into a friend is to forgive him. As I said in the beginning, this one sentence prayer gave grace to the whole nation of Israel for 40 years until 70 AD in which many repented and turned to Jesus Christ. That is the reason forgiveness is so powerful. And this is one character which is foreign to our souls. Discipleship is learning to live and love like Jesus. And that means learning to spend our lives like he spent his life. And we have the book of Acts, as we all know. A book which is absence of resentment and revenge. Absence of retaliation. 
and Jesus asks us, the church, to do the hard things. If you are listening, other than that which Jesus spoke on the cross as a prayer on the first word, you are listening to, to a salesman trying to sell something other than the products of Jesus. Dear people of God, just think through this prayer. What if Jesus has opted out of the 56 options that he had before him on that day? If on the cross Jesus has opted anything other than forgiveness, Christian faith would have vanished away on that first Good Friday. On the, in that first century. On that same cross, it would have been meaningless. And John 3.16 would have not been alive after the first Good Friday. The challenge before us is to see how much of forgiveness does I nourish for my soul. Because forgiveness is not native to our souls. And Jesus demands that to be evident in all of our lives. That one character of forgiveness, that one spirit of forgiveness only can lead us into eternity. Through this prayer for executioners on the cross, Jesus makes it explicitly clear that if you are to live in the reign of God, where there is only freedom, it will mean practicing radical forgiveness. It means forgiving even when it feels impossible. Jesus' prayer for the executioners. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Loving Lord, we thank you for this wonderful revelation. As a guru of this church, you have set an example of forgiveness. Give us the grace to set aside our egos because unforgiveness has broken our families, our relationships, both in the families and in the workplaces, in the church fellowship, and we need your grace upon us this afternoon to be ministered by the Holy Spirit. Continue to speak to us. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for bringing such a wonderful message to us. Before we meditate on the second word, shall we all stand and sing together the hymn 435, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Shall we all sing? We'll sing first and last stanza.
please be seated. Let us open our Bibles to Luke 23, 39 to 43. Luke 23, 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy gospel. I now invite Reverend John to please come forward and share to us the second word on the cross. Before we meditate on the word of God, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we commit ourselves unto you, Lord. Speak to us today, O Father. Let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name I pray. Dear people of God, The first word, the word of forgiveness. And later on, a few moments after, again Jesus uttered as a response, the word of salvation. The word of salvation telling to the penitent thief, the repentant, the one who repented, or one who said of Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. Dear people of God, here there are some interesting things. We have a four Gospels, as you all know. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, uh, we call them as a synoptic Gospel. And uh, all, the other, all the Gospels mention about the crucifixion of uh, Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And all uh, the stories they mention. But the events are, there are some little differences that we can see here. Here in Matthew and uh, Mark, Matthew and Mark, they also mention about how the Lord uh, was crucified and how the people were mocking. There we see some uh, similarities. There are much of the similarities here. The similarities like Lord Jesus Christ uh, was crucified. He was crucified on the uh, Mount uh, Golgotha or the Mount of the Skull or it is called the Calvary. And, uh, and not only that one, it also mentions about uh, uh, those who passed by in Matthew 27 and uh, verse 39 we see those who passed by hurl insult at him. And the same thing in Mark 15, uh, verse 29, also we see the same word, the same word insulting at him. And the same thing in uh, Matthew uh, 27, 41. It also says, in the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. And in Mark 15, verse uh, 31 also says, in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law 
mocked him among themselves. That's a little something, you not know, the words are uh, uh, mixed up here. And also, uh, it also says in uh, Matthew 27, verse 44, it says, In the same way, the rebels who were crucified, see here, the rebels or the thieves, those who were crucified with him, also heaped insults on him. Also, means the thieves here, uh, here Matthew says both of them. And here Mark also says, uh, here in the verse 32, he says, in Matthew 15, verse 32, it says, Let this Messiah, this is the King of Israel, came, come down fr now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And it says, last, those crucified with him also heap insults on him. But here, Luke gives the uh, gospel according to Luke. The, uh, Luke gives us a uh, little difference uh, different here. There is a little uh, difference that we can see here. Here, what uh, he says here is that uh, from the beginning of the verse 39, uh, Luke 23, verse 39, it says, One of the criminal who hung there hurled insult at him. The difference here is in Mark, uh, Matthew and Mark, we don't know exactly exactly what uh, was that. But there it says uh, both of them or uh, those crucified with him, they hurled or uh, they could not uh, hear it properly. But we have something very important in Luke because it is what uh, the Jesus' response here. So here it says, one of the criminal who hung there who hurled insult at him, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. This first thief, the one Jesus was uh, uh, in between of these two thieves, and it is as per the prophecy also. And here we see the one, either it may be a left or right, we do not know. But it says that one of the thieves was telling that you save yourself and save us. It may be because he had heard people saying that one. The crowd that they were uh, around Lord Jesus Christ or the, those who were passing, they, he might have heard that one or from, uh, uh, far from uh, the way, from the palace to the, uh, that uh, Golgotha uh, mount, he, the, he might have heard the people who are saying uh, all these things. And here he might have heard that one and he is telling the same thing what the other were telling. No, what the other, he was going along with the people, you know. He was going along with the chief priest. He was going along with the law, the teachers of the law. And he was also going along with the elders as per uh, uh, Matthew. They are they, one of the thief is going along with that and he is telling if you are a God, if you are a Messiah, if you are a Christ, then you, if you have saved others, you can save yourself and also you can save us. You can save us. He did not recognize what Lord is. But the beauty here comes is the other thief. The other thief here, uh, starting from verse 40, it says, But the other criminal rebuked him. Stop talking all these things. He rebuked him. He, when he is rebuking this particular to that person or the other thief, he is also rebuking all the other who are mocking at Lord Jesus Christ. He he, by this word, we can see that he must have rebuked all those things. Or we can understand that he is not only rebuking the thief, that thief, but he is also rebuking those who are mocking or those who are insulting Lord Jesus Christ. What does he say here? He says, don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. He is telling to his fellow thief, he is telling, see, what we are getting, or we are punished 
because of our own deeds you know what mistake you did you know what crime you did you know what is the uh, punishment for this crime you know that one and because of that in spite of knowing all this you have committed that one and we are experiencing that punishment that punishment but whereas we did not hear anything or any crime that lord jesus christ has did you are the other we can just imagine that the first thief is just going with what the other people are telling or they are blaming or they are cursing or insulting what they are telling you say yourself as a christ then save yourself that was the statement and he he is also giving the same statement here but the other thief the other thief is rebuking him and he is coming with some strong statements here and he is coming and he is telling we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve but this man has done nothing wrong but this man the one who is hung with us this man has done nothing nothing he might be knowing because this drama is happening all over at that moment because the one that has to be hung on the cross the three were to be hung and maybe uh, the other one uh, where uh, in spite of jesus christ he was uh, uh, he was he got the freedom they were all the three were knowing what their fault is and what their sin is what their crime is but all of the sudden the other man is coming between them it means that these two thieves were knowing that this person is innocent and because of something else they are making him as a crime and maybe that is the reason why this uh, the other thief is telling here but this man has done nothing that is the greatest proclamation that is the greatest uh, statement that is he is making you know he is making in front of many others he is making this statement he is making this statement against against those who are mocking they are all great leaders there they are all great people there high priests are there they are there are elders there in front of them he is making this st statement dear people of god and that's what uh, we need and our lord has promised uh, him and our lord has responded and uh, uh, to his cry he proclaimed he rebuked and he said he has done nothing and then afterwards he come or he turned to lord jesus christ and telling he is praying to our lord jesus christ and said jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom remember me when you come into your kingdom and jesus answered him truly i tell you today you will be with me in paradise today you will be with me in paradise many of us have a question what is this paradise what is this paradise paradise is a heaven or paradise is something a different place in the all here some of uh, uh, the quotations here and uh, according to strong's concordance also we can see something here that what does the paradise mean a garden taken from the ancient persian word for garden or a park and this makes sense in the context of uh, adam and eve they were there and that speaks about that paradise or uh, that thing that we can just relate this one to the uh, to the new testament uh, text uh, revelation 2:7 it says whoever as ears let them hear what the spirit says to the churches to the one who is victorious to the one who is victorious i will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of god which is in the paradise of god 
this might be because here it is the word of salvation it is the victorious word to the uh, to the other thief and he has an a right to eat from the tree of life maybe this one lord jesus christ may be mean uh, of meaning of this one which is in the paradise of god and the second thing that we can see here in luke 16:22 to 23 it says the time came when the beggar died and the angel carried him to abraham's side the rich man also died and was buried in age where he was in torment he looked up and saw abraham far away with lazarus by his side it also says that the bosom of abraham that the part of sheol it might be the waiting period for for the people the righteous people waiting for the resurrection that may be a waiting period for them and uh, the other thing also the uh, the third thing that we can see here it might be an uh, upper region or uh, the third heaven the third heaven which we can see it in second corinthians 12 was 2 to 4 as paul says i know a man in christ who f- for who for 14 years man who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven whether it was in body or out of the body i do not know god knows and i know that this man whether in the body or apart from the body i do not know but god knows was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things things that no one is permitted to tell second corinthians 12:4 it says like that i he caught up to the paradise and heard in experience inexpressible things we do not know exactly for what the lord was telling about but there is a place called paradise because our lord jesus christ has uh, proclaimed it as lord jesus christ has said that one dear people of god what do we learn from this what do we see this one every year we celebrate good friday every year we meditate the words on the cross that lord jesus christ had heard yes dear people of god let us just see these things jesus never responded to the hurling or the heaped insults of the crowd or priests or teachers of the law but he forgave them he prayed for them he did not listen to those who are insulting him but he forgives them and he asked god to forgive them and also he did not respond to them but he respond to the prayer of that thief even today let us neglect or let us forgive all those who are coming against you all those who want to hurt you all those who are doing evil to you forgive them and pray for them and do what the lord has did and the other thing that we can see here is this thief's acknowledgement that is also very important that we need to do he accepted he was a sinner and the punishment was according to his deed we need to accept that one we need to accept we are sinners and what we are going through is because of our own deeds that we we need to accept he rebuked the other thief he rebuked the others that is also very important to us means to stand with the lord to stand with the word of god whatever it says it is right and i am standing with this one i am standing with lord jesus christ he said love your neighbors as yourself yes i will love that should be our stand and that should be the things either should be a rebuking as well as standing for the christ that should be the things he earnestly prayed and it is also the necessary things we need to pray we need to pray when we pray when we say to the lord you are my savior save me when we say to the lord you are my god help me and definitely god is ready there is a immediate answer to us also 
there is an immediate response from the lord also he is going to stretch he has stretched already his arms and he hung and he died for us when he gave his life for us will he not give you what you have asked definitely he will do it may god bless you all may god give you the wisdom and the heart that the other thief may god bless you let's pray thank you lord for listening to us and thank you for speaking to us lord help us to be a, a repented person help us to stand for you help us to bow down before you as this thief acknowledged that you are the king and lord even today we acknowledge you are the king and we beseech you always remember us and lord you be beseech save us and lead us and guide us and protect us may your name be glorified in jesus name i pray dear people of god now we have a special song by kmc choir or to kmc choir
Thank you, uh, Kaya, for the beautiful number. Our Lord uttered the third word on the cross, and, the, and it is taken from the Gospel according to John chapter 19, verses from 25 to 27. Chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Here it says, Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Colpus, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son, and to the disciple, here is your mother. From that day, from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Here in the reading, may I request uh, Brother Ami Ushatam to bring the third word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our heart be acceptable in thy sight, our Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. People of God, the path that Jesus provides is not the only path in life. You know, there are other spiritual roads, other philosophical paths, any number of routes that our inner GPS might put us on by default. For example, selfish hedonism or what is called as pleasure seeking, for example, is a wide path that proves popular in every generation. But Jesus' way is the only one that will get us where we want to go, to life in the presence of the fullness and the beauty of God. So, if we are headed in any other direction, the first thing we need to do is make a turnaround and get on the right road. We have got to repent and receive God's forgiveness. The moment we do we have arrived at our first word, which is the word of forgiveness. Father is waiting with open arms to forgive us. And then we see whenever a lost sinner repents of sin and trusts Jesus Christ as Savior, that person is born into God's family and immediately becomes a child of God. Then we reach our second word, the word of salvation. In John 1.12, we read, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And now we come to the third word, a word of relationship. I have titled my short exhortation as Redefined Relationships. Redefined Relationships. That's what our pastor read for us today from the Gospel according to John, verse, chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. Now, as we all recollect what happened on that day, we was their duty. But gospel writer also records four women and one man. Men, one man. They were, they were there because they loved Jesus. They were there out of devotion and not duty. They wanted to be with Jesus. 
and the bible says there was mary the mother of our lord and there was mary magdalene and mary's sister which most commentators suggest that it is salome who was also the wife of zebedee and the mother of james and john and finally we see mary the wife of cleophas was standing there along with the beloved disciple john now christians today use the phrase near the cross to describe their dedication and devotion to jesus now perhaps we have prayed lord keep me near the cross but we have not stopped to think what we are really praying if we are willing to pay the price to have our prayer answered the lord may say to us he as he said to james and john for you do not know what you ask today being near the cross is not a matter of physical geography but it refers to a spiritual position a special relationship to jesus christ to be near the cross means to identify with christ in his suffering and shame and as the writer to the hebrew says to go outside the camp bearing his reproach or what paul says the fellowship of his sufferings so this statement of our lord made from the cross helps us to understand what it means to be near the cross perhaps the best way to approach our study would be to talk to these four people who were standing near the cross though i interviewed all of them i am going to shorten their interviews but only focus on the interview with mary the mother of jesus but to mary magdalene near the cross was a place of redemption as we all know our lord jesus christ redeemed mary magdalene and set her free from the terrible bondage of demonism and to salome mary's sister it was a place of refuge we remember her as the woman who came to jesus with her sons asking him to let them be enthroned on his right and his left hand in his kingdom and to john this disciple this was a place of responsibility if you ask john john would answer this is a place of responsibility in receiving mary into my home i am taking jesus's place in caring for her however to mary mother of jesus this was a place of reward or this was the place of her salvation it is interesting to note that in all of john's gospel the mother of jesus is mentioned only twice in chapter 2 and now in chapter 19 and her name mary is never mentioned because of luke's gospel we think mary the mother of jesus as a very particular being with a distinct personality but that is not the way the fourth gospel portrays her in john's gospel she plays a symbolic role in both her johanin appearances jesus calls her woman so there is something more at stake here you know jesus was on the cross at this point 3 hours before the darkness came at the noon during those 3 hours he spoke only thrice jesus said only three sentences in 3 hours think about it that is a massive amount of silence and when he speaks the crowd listens up oh he's saying something he's speaking so when the cross is set in place when they nailed him to the cross it says the bible says jesus looks up father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing then silence jesus later he turns to the side to speak to the thief today you will be with me in paradise then silence later jesus looks down and speaks to his mother woman behold your son it was the nailing that led jesus to say father forgive them 
It was the thief that led him to say, today you will be with me in paradise. What was it that led Christ to speak to his mother at this moment? Chuck Swindoll, a pastor, he points out that Jesus spoke to his mother when the soldiers cast lots for his robe. We read that in the previous two verses in 23 and 24. They had taken the rest of his clothes and divided them, but the robe was seamless and they decided to cast lots rather than tear it. So Swindoll asked this question, who do you think would have woven this robe? Who would have made such a beautiful garment for our savior? Then Swindoll asked, why now? She has been there all along, watching and weeping. Could it be because of the seamless tunic? I think so. When they touched the tunic, they touched something very near to his heart. The garment made for him by his mother. I think Swindoll was right. Out came the lords and they are gambling and laughing. They touch his robe and Jesus looked down at his mother in love and great compassion and says, woman, here is your son. Now, what is Christ saying here? How could John possibly replace Jesus? Yes, many people, you know, they exhort this verse as the kindness of Jesus to provide care for his mother. Yes, John can care for Mary, but John can never take place of Jesus. So, why does Jesus say, here is your son? You know, some of you might have experienced the irreplaceable loss of a child. Now, to go to a mother and, who has lost her child and say, well, there are other children for you. It completely fails to grasp the unique bond between a mother and a child to whom she has given birth. You know, in the birth of Jesus, Mary found indescribable joy. And now, as he suffers, she feels and experiences an irreplaceable loss. John can never take place of Jesus. Everyone knows that. So there is something more going on here than Jesus simply providing for the future care of his mother. And what is that? The relationship between Jesus and Mary is changing. That's what I call redefining the relationship. For 33 years, Jesus has been the son of Mary according to the flesh. But as you know, he was also the son of God. He assumed human flesh which he took from his mother so he could become our redeemer. This is why he came into this world and this is why he was on the cross right now. Now on the cross, the blood is draining from his body. The life is ebbing away from his flesh and the old order is passing and the relationship between Mary and our Lord is changing. As Mary stands at the foot of the cross in her grief and in her sorrow, she must have been crying out, my son, my son, my son. And Jesus is saying, no, you must no longer think of me as your son. Woman, behold your son. From now on, John is to take place in your life. Regard, regard him as your son. Well, then how is she to regard Jesus now? She should regard Jesus now as her savior and as her Lord. When the angel told Mary about this child to be born, she said in Luke 147, my spirit rejoices in God my savior. You see, she had always looked to God as her savior. So how would God save her? Answer, Jesus goes to the cross and lays down the life he had drawn from Mary. His body is broken. His blood is poured out. Mary's son dies and in his death, he becomes her savior. Amen. So I want you to understand what was happening here. It is wonderful. Mary loses an irreplaceable son and she gains an incomparable savior. Mary's gain was far greater than her loss. 
she lost the joys of a son who had brought her happiness on earth but she gained the joys of a savior at whose right hand in heaven there are pleasures evermore she gave him life in the flesh for a time now he gave her life in the spirit for eternity now roll the story fast forward and mary has been in heaven for what nearly 2000 years now if she could be here today she would say the life he gave to me is by far greater than the life i gave to him flesh gives birth to flesh says john but the spirit gives birth to spirit john 3:6 by the flesh mary's life was in jesus but by the spirit his life was now in her Jesus said on one occasion in John 6:63 the flesh counts for nothing so Mary's joy lies not in the life she gave to Jesus but in the life Jesus gave to her Mary would say to us now i was so privileged to have this unique relationship with him in the flesh but that changed at the cross there was a relationship reset that happened at the cross in his agony he made it quite clear mary would say that john was taking his place in that regard the flesh passes away and i entered heaven not because jesus is my son but because jesus is my savior not because he is mine by birth but because i am his by faith Amen. so to mary mother of jesus it was a place of reward or salvation in closing let me give you an illustration you may have heard about a certain wedding that took place almost a decade ago in fact about 13 years ago what a marvelous occasion that was as prince william was joined in marriage to kate middleton on the day of the wedding the london times led with a piece on the front page entitled to marry her prince in which they described how this private tale of love captured the imagination of people from delhi to dallas they wrote one couple one moment and the whole world watching william arthur philip louis windsor of wales will marry catherine elizabeth middleton at 11 this morning in the presence of his grandmother her majesty the queen one of them was born to take his place in the history books the other a girl who was destined to lead a life of peaceful anonymity until fate and he stepped in she wakes up today in a london hotel Kate Middleton a girl about town she goes to sleep in Buckingham Palace tonight a princess of the realm that's beautiful here is a girl born a commoner but by union with the prince she becomes part of the royal household she did not get there by birth she got there by union with the prince martin luther says like this He says faith unites the soul with Jesus Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom faith unites you and me to Jesus Christ so that you share his life the reason that he took our flesh born of the virgin mary is so that you should share his life for all eternity and you won't get there by anything that is in you by birth you will only get there by union with this prince this king this savior so mary got there not by flesh but by union through the spirit that invitation to be one with him is his invitation to you today the bible says in john 5:21 the son gives life to whomever he is pleased to give whoever you are by birth people of god jesus christ invites you to come to him today on this good friday he is pleased to give that life to you let us pray father we marvel that life eternal 
that a place in the royal household of eternity should be offered to us commoners sinners to jesus christ at his infinite cost and for our infinite good and blessing we thank you that our eternity is not defined by by what we are through birth but we thank you for our savior who with love says come to me and is ready to embrace as we come to him so father in christ help us to find this life eternal in jesus our savior's name we pray amen on behalf of all of us i would like to thank brother amy for bringing us this blessed message on third word shall we all rise up and sing hymn number 418 o sacred head now wounded As we move on to the fourth word, I request all of us to open our Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter twenty-nine, verses from forty-five to forty-seven. 
Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses from 45. Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, This man is calling Elijah. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy gospel. I now invite Sister Chandra to please come forward and share the fourth word with us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we surrender our hearts and our minds. Help us to focus and follow your words. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Picture yourself standing at the base of a hill just outside Jerusalem called Calvary. This is where our Jesus, who is incredibly important to us, is been crucified. It is a serious and emotional moment with many people, soldiers, and the big cross where Jesus is hanging. It's recorded just now we heard from the word from Matthew 27, 45 to 47. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he is calling Eliezer. I'm just going to focus two things. Why darkness and why this cry? If you look throughout the Bible, darkness often symbolizes spiritual realities, such as sin, evil, and judgment. We see in Exodus uh, chapter 10, verses from 21 to 23, darkness is one of the plague upon Egypt representing God's judgment. In Isaiah 9-2, darkness symbolizes spiritual blindness. When Jesus was crucified, there was a period of darkness in the middle of the day. This darkness lasted for three hours. That was the Bible records, which is abnormal for a regular cloudy day or an eclipse. During Jesus' time, the land where he lived was ruled by Romans and they often used crucifixions as a punishment, as we all know this. This happened during a Jewish festival called Passover, which was a very important time for the Jewish people. Now, eclipses were not back then, but the darkness during Jesus' crucifixion happened at the wrong time for a natural eclipse. Plus, it, was, it wasn't just a small area that went dark, but it was the whole land. Some people have tried to explain this darkness as a result of natural events like a dust storm or an eclipse. But those explanations does not quite fit the details of what happened. But many Christians, we believe that this darkness, this darkness was something very, very special. Almost like a sign from God. It was a way to show how much Jesus went through on the cross 
just for you and for me. It was like the whole world taking a pause to recognize the significant event at the cross to save humanity from sin. There was a silence and the silence breaks and Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabasthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The cry of fourth word highlights the depth of Jesus' humanity as he experienced the full weight of human sin and separation from God. At the same time, it underscores the mystery of the incarnation, the belief that Jesus is both fully divine and fully human. Despite his endures, Jesus remained faithful to God, God's will, and ultimately fulfilled his mission of providing salvation through his sacrificial death on the cross. In, th in theology, there is a term called um, a hypostatic union. This means, this means that, that in Jesus there are two natures. Okay, so one is he is 100% fully God all time and 100% fully human at all time. Perhaps no greater time in human history than this were recorded when the humanity of Jesus was put on full display. Jesus' cry on the cross is distinct. Why? Because he was sinless. Jesus, unlike others, was without sin. In Hebrew 4.15 records, he was sinless, yet he died for us. Fulfillment of prophecy. His cry quotes Psalm 22 verse 1, fulfilling messianic prophecy. Redemptive purpose. His suffering is seen as atonement for humanity's sin. Romans 5, 8. Unique relationship with God as God's son. His cry reflects his unique connection with the Father. Here is a simple example for children to understand the line, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We have many Sunday school children here, right? Can I see your hands? All the children here? Yes. Imagine you are in the park. Okay, playing with your friends. Suddenly you fall down and you get hurt. You see your parents sitting there close to you. So you ask or cry out, say, or Amma or Appa. You, you call for help. But you realize they don't come immediately to help you. How will you feel? Scared? Or maybe left out? Nobody cares me, <laughs> right? And we feel all alone. Sometimes we feel, we feel ashamed. This is just a simple example I'm giving you. This is something like, like this. That moment when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was fully human. And he felt very hurt and pain. And he could not take it, the weight of the sin of people. And he felt God has forgotten him. He felt he was left alone. There's no one. That's the reason he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Though Jesus knew, missing why he was dying at the cross, but still, that moment, he was very hurt. He could not take it. Eventually, parents come and help, and we feel very comforted. So Jesus 
had a big reason why he had to die on the cross was because so that you and I will have salvation in him. Here is a short poem I'll ask uh, Sammy from Sunday School to read out for us. Why I ask him to read this? Whenever, when I talk about cross, I go wordless. I have no words to explain what really Jesus went through at the cross for us. Every time I, I have no words to express. And this poem as I was reading, I was so touched. So I thought let Sammy read out for us as we listen and let reflect God's sacrifice, sacrifice, uh, God's sacrifice at the cross for us. what our Christ, our Savior went through and we have been hearing and meditating on this year after year. For many of us, it may be many years we are in the Lord. Some of us, maybe we are seeking. Now what I do with this truth? Every Good Friday, I hear seven words. Now what I do with this truth? Here is a question for you and I. I just want you to remember one word, arise. This is what you and I can do. Arise, acknowledge darkness. What does it mean? Identify sin or struggle or challenges in your life. Otherwise, my church, no use of listening to seven words year after year. We need to acknowledge, we need to see where we are. Romans 3, 28 says, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. None of us here sitting can say, I don't have any darkness, I have no struggle, no sin. None of us, even including our pastors, none of us we can say. That is one of the reasons God has offered. And beautifully, our men of God, all of them explain so beautifully, you know, what our Christ has offered for us at the cross. So first thing is acknowledge darkness. Second, reflect on Christ's sacrifice. Remember his sacrifice for forgiveness. That was the first word we heard. Remember forgiveness. Find hope in redemption. There is a, always we have a struggle, right, in our real life. Theological conviction and harsh reality. So what does it mean? Theological conviction says that God has a wonderful plan and purposes for my life. The harsh reality, I lose job, I failed in exam, I lose property. And the theological conviction says that God loved us unconditionally. But here I feel separated from parents, 
or maybe divorce, okay, a loss of loved ones. This is the reality we all go through. How many of us sitting here can say, I don't go through all this. I have gone through so much in my life. And I'm for sure all of you who are sitting here agree with me. Yes? Yes, we have gone through it. Maybe we are going through or maybe we have gone through. But you know what? When I look back my life, the first time I used to say, my God, why you have forsaken me? I come from a Hindu family. Many, many years back, I had shared my testimony here, you know. Uh, here, many, there's, I think uh, 15 years back, I shared my testimony here. But today I'm not going to share because we don't have much time. But I had asked this question, not knowing Bible, and I never wanted to know about Jesus, but this is what I said, you have forsaken me because I was very devoted, a uh, so-called religious girl, but I never felt that way, like I never had connection with God, and I said that. There was a situation that I went through in my life. I felt, I felt God has forgotten. I felt nobody is with me, alone. But you know what? After many years, when I look back now, my situation, I can only thank God. Because God knew what was best for me. Right? The word of God says, all things were good for those who love God. Now I'm able to say that. So, accept reality, but you are not forgotten by God, and God is with you and with me. Internalize forgiveness and grace. Accept forgiveness, extend forgiveness. Sometimes it's easy to accept forgiveness, but forgiving others, it's difficult. So, as I as God remind us today, reflect on your life. Seek transformation. Move from darkness to light. Share your story with others, what God has done to you. Embrace new life. Embrace abundant life in Christ. Embrace spiritual growth. Remembering arise can help you acknowledge darkness. Reflect on Christ's sacrifice internalize forgiveness, seek transformation, and embrace new life. Even any one of this, none of this, if you are able to remember, just remember one thing. I'm going to end with this. In the silence, God, it doesn't mean God is absent from your life. In the silence, it doesn't mean God is absent from your life. Stay connected to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word and reminding us as a God, you have gone through what it means to be human and what it means to go through suffering and struggle. You have not left us alone. You are always with us. Help us to step out with this truth. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you, sister, for the wonderful quotation. Uh, May God bless you and use you mightily. Before we Listen to the fifth word. Shall we all stand and sing together the hymn 120, Rock of Ages, Clap for Me? Shall we all stand?
and be seated for the fifth word scripture is taken from the gospel according to john chapter 19 verses 28 and 29 john 19 28 and 29 here it says later knowing that all was completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled jesus said i am thirsty a jar of wine vinegar was there so they soaked sponge in it uh, but put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to jesus lips here in the reading may god add his abundant blessing on the reading now i uh, call our guest speaker reverend uh, wilbert wellens uh, to bring the word of god that god has bestowed upon him or to pastor as we continue to meditate the seven words of our lord jesus christ from the cross and this is the fifth word request uh, them to display please John chapter 19 verse 28 Could you please display that if you have and I would request you all to read with me just this verse John chapter 19 verse 28 Thank you <clears throat> Let's read together After this Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished the scripture might be fulfilled said i thirst heavenly father we want to thank you for bringing us together to reflect and to respond on this good friday and we pray oh lord give us the inner strength anoint us with your holy spirit bless us in christ name we pray amen <clears throat> jesus christ was on a mission and on the cross the mission was coming to an end to fulfill and whenever you look at the ministry and the work of our lord jesus christ every time he was trying to glorify god because that was his mission whatever god had asked him to accomplish and he was trying to do that and this particular verse we need to look at the part of fulfilling god's mission in him he fulfilled god god's mission preaching he fulfilled god mission in healing he was fulfilling the mission of god in delivering and he was fulfilling the mission of god the good news and he was setting people free but how is he fulfilling god's will even in this verse it gives us a clear indication there is a word called he said this that scripture may be fulfilled one of the things that we need to look at it jesus as a human at the same time jesus as son of god divinity both were operating in him and now when we look at this particular word the fifth word from the cross we need to club together and see closely how jesus christ is fulfilling god's mission through this word and one of the indications as i said that scripture must be fulfilled now we all know that jesus christ from the previous night there were three judgment quickly judge and he was taken he was whipped and he was beaten 
and the thorns of the crown was put on his head and all that physical pain that he was going and then he was finally nailed on the cross and the mission is slowly coming to an end there was an intense physical pain that my savior our lord our savior was going through intentionally knowing fully well and he was prepared to go through and he never said that he could have said that i i don't want to go he didn't say that and he was going through this pain so that he would fulfill the mission of god in his life through his life even in our lives so there was a intense pain that was going on in his body and there we we know because he was oozing and his tongue was dried and the dehydration and all of that it is true that he was in a physical pain my dear brothers and sisters as we sit here it's important to understand he went through pain so that he understands your pain and my pain he went through this and out of this agony comes out this word i thirst he was he was thirsty because of the situation that he is in the circumstances that he is in and he is hung on the cross people were watching and everything all sorts of things were going on and he was thirsty and he says i thirst but the question it doesn't stop there it doesn't stop necessarily with the physical pain alone there is another side of his life he is a divinity and therefore he had to fulfill what the scripture had said psalm 69 verse 21 it talks about what we read because jesus was aware that he had to fulfill the will of the father and now when we look at that one and before we get into the spiritual pain between physical and spiritual comes an emotional pain why <clears throat> because people were mocking at him as he was suffering on the cross people were mocking how do you feel when you actually physically suffer and your loved one says no no it's okay you are just this is not a big pain for you how do you feel that how do you feel that when you go through a pain an emotional you know a negative response when you when you receive you go through an emotional pain because people were mocking and people spat on him people spat on him and then there is a huge area that he undergoes is the spiritual pain because father has turned away from him he literally left him he is not with him he is turned away his face from him as he takes upon himself our sins on the cross he the lord god the father has turned away his face looking at all of the sins of humanity on his son our lord and savior jesus christ huge spiritual pain that he goes through why because he voluntarily accepted to take your sin take my sin take all of our sin and sin of the whole world because there is need not be the blood 
of the lamb because son of god came down to shed his blood once for all so that you and i could be forgiven there is a big huge spiritual pain my friends our lord and our savior is going through because he chose to endure this for our sake so that any time we come and say lord thank you that you took my sin my very sin this sin on the cross i know lord you'll forgive me and he says my child i forgive you and this spiritual pain was so intense so intense that's why he says the scripture might be fulfilled might be fulfilled and we know during the everyone the there was a question they were questioning our lord jesus christ the jewish authorities questioned before the pilot during the brutal treatment he received from soldiers while he was hung on the cross in agony jesus was not like a helpless victim but he was almighty he was a almighty god but that time he came to take our sin voluntarily he take he came to take our sin voluntarily and therefore this is a i thirst is a cry to fulfill the scripture and even there the lord jesus christ is doing the will of god in fulfilling the scripture he was doing the will of god in fulfilling the scripture therefore he says in john chapter 17 verse for i brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you gave to me this is what jesus was preparing the work has been completed if suffering and now he is on the cross and says i thirst it was a cry to fulfill the scripture it was also at the same time to fulfill it was a cry at the same time of agony because there was a total sense of devotion that our lord and savior devoted for the entire mankind there was a silence and the physical suffering and agony was upon him and the combination of these both were so intense and out of that this comes but when we know that when he says that i thirst he is basically thirsting for you and for me and what he is saying is i am thirsting that the sins of the whole world would be forgiven now with his precious blood on the cross because he is so helpless there he is hung his arms legs everything was you know there was a nails and he could not come out he was so helpless on the cross on the cross and it was a cry of an agony and therefore what we know is jesus commitment to forgive our sins and gives us redemption at the same time to fulfill the scripture his commitment to his own word of god and now we know that he was in between two the cross that they rejected and there was another cross next to him gave a reception lord it should not happen to you it can only happen to us when we deserve that and what a beautiful contrast as we sit here between the cross that rejected and the cross that gave a reception for the cross that was ready for the redemption and now the choice is between all between the both the crosses 
either you can reject or you can receive because Jesus Christ when he said it the i thirst he was thirsting that your sins would be forgiven my sins would be forgiven therefore as we sit here we all have thirst isn't it we thirst for success no doubt about it we thirst for promotion it's okay we thirst for so many things but the question that we need to ask this afternoon is does our thirst pointing back to the father god does our thirst points it back to god or does that thirst points and stops with me if that stops with me the thirst that our lord said i thirst it has no meaning we have insulted the fifth word of our lord jesus christ conveniently because all of our thirst if it does not point back to the father god it does not make sense why all that we have all that we possess all that we do all that we accomplish all that we 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 see everything has come from god and everything belongs to god but however we all have thirst but the deeper question that we need to ask all the time is does this thirst points it back to the father god and he was saying i am thirst because the scripture might be fulfilled scripture might be fulfilled my dear brothers and sisters we all come here it's good to come it's good to partake in a service like this it's good to sing songs but it's not enough we need to ask the inner thirst that we have lord i thank you i have this thirst but lord give me wisdom and direct me that all of my thirst would point back to father god and i'll tell you when you do that your thirst will be fulfilled your thirst will be quenched not with that and they said in verse 29 it says a, a jar full of sour wine was standing there so they put a sponge full of sour wine upon the branch of his cup and brought it up to his mouth <laughs> they brought it back they brought it to his mouth that was not the thirst that will quench our lord did he drink it did he enjoy it did he say thank you did he appreciate no because that was not he was asking for although he was voluntarily going through the physical thirst 100% but at the same time the divinity of christ was also evident in verse the fifth was my friends and for i pray that as we continually think about it as we continually ponder about it and i pray that all of our thirst would be moved in the direction the thirst for forgiveness thirst for love thirst for belongingness thirst for worship thirst for prayer thirst for fellowship this would increase so that this thirst what our savior our lord said and uttered on the cross of calvary in a place called golgotha would make sense and he will say you know what well done my servant well done i this is for i thirst so that you would forgive so that you will love 
so that you will develop belongingness so that you will become fellowship so that you will be a witness so that so that so that and your thirst you know what happened pointing back to the father god father god look at and evaluate the thirst of yours sometimes our thirst could be absolutely misleading is calculated and they may become miserable and towards the end what kind of thirst i had it has taken me from here to there now and our lord says i thirst the scripture might be fulfilled and father we need to ask our lord god who said i will give you the water that you will never be thirsty again the water that i give jesus said in john chapter 4 in you it will become the living water welling up to eternal life isn't it beautiful in you the water that i give you he says to the woman who had a lot of reputation he says the water that i give you in you it will become a fountain and that fountain and welling up to eternal life and that's what we are here for that's what we are longing for that's what this week is all about and that's what those seven words are for at this thirst become and it will well up so that we will see the eternity to the thirst that you and i have may the lord direct our thirst so that all of your thirst and my thirst will point back take back to the father god god bless you thank you sir for the wonderful uh, message thank you for bringing us the exact the meaning of why our lord said i am thirsty thank you now we have a special number i invite kmc choir to give up a special number
Thank you, choir, for the wonderful number. God bless you. For the sixth word, the scripture portion is taken from Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 29 and 30. John 19, verses 29, verses 29 and 30. It says, the jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked sponge in it put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed, bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Here in the reading, may God add his blessing on reading and meditating of the word. And now may I invite Reverend Uday Kumar to bring the word of God for us. Ketelesthe is the word that is used in Greek for it is finished. We have one word in Greek, three words in English. In Kannada, there is only one word, tiritu. The Kannada is uh, more closer to Hebrew and Greek than English. We don't know that. And in Hindi, it is pura hua. It is not pura samapt ho gaya, nahi. It is pura boy. In other words, it is fulfilled. It is used for that. Uh, for example, the tribute is given as a tax to Caesar, and whether to give him or not, the same word is used. In other words, can we pay him or not? In other words, Jesus, when he said that it is finished, simply means it is fully paid. Not that it is fully paid. It is not simply finished something or accomplish something uh, that Jesus is talking about. It is a small word, but loaded with the meaning. What we are doing on Good Friday is enacting what has happened 2,000 years ago in front of the cross or what has happened on the cross. All the seven of us here speaking, we are speaking about what has happened 2000 years ago. And we take the words of Jesus and then tell here what did he say, why did he say, what is the meaning and so on. So this is a historical fact that we are witnessing this afternoon. What is a historical fact? Jesus died on the cross and said something. That is a historical fact. The choir sang a song. Huh? Were you there when they crucified the Lord? How many of us were there? That is a historic question in the song. Do you know that? A Negro spiritual. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were we there? If we are not there, then what are we doing on Good Friday? If we were not there before the cross, then what are we doing on Good Friday? That's why the speakers will enact what is there, what is said in, the, in front of the cross or on the cross. And that is what we say, it is history. When we remember history, we have to say what the gospel says. We don't put masala into it. We don't make kichidi out of that. You understand, it is not my opinion or somebody's opinion. 
and even the gospel writers remember that they gave exactly what has happened all the gospels are written after the resurrection 50 years yet they did not interpret that in the light of what they experienced after 50 years they simply stated what happened to jesus christ but good friday has done something and that we have taken that what was historicity added tradition into it added scripture into it and there is a subjective experience added to that and then say what shall i do on good friday so we prepare ourselves for what for what we were not a witness for that we are preparing ourselves emotionally and maybe spiritually and with discipline fasting and other things and you know drinking ganji and all those things today uh, they, these are the things that we prepare in order to identify ourselves with the sufferings of jesus christ now is that history or an experience if you go by that gospel record now we have what we are doing is we have a post resurrected understanding of the cross and the sufferings of jesus christ and not what the gospel is talking about gospel doesn't talk about all the four gospels they don't talk about that but what we are doing today in the first year 21st century is that we have post resurrected interpretation of the cross and jesus christ and therefore we ascribe all those things and say he died for me am i right were there anybody at the cross who said he died for me oh yes or no did anyone now how is that on good friday we say this therefore our understanding is different not even one person was there you died for me on the cross when jesus died that is history pure history you understand and what has happened and all those things that is a, a different thing but that is where we need to understand on good friday what are we doing we take that history and we have some subjective element or experience and put that into it and try to understand oh how he died how he bled how he was mocked how he was tortured all these things we bring into good friday that is why i call it is good friday but was it a good friday when jesus died on the cross did anybody say it was a good friday huh did anyone say it is a good friday weeping and yelling and all those things were there yes particularly women and jesus said don't show pity on me daughters of jerusalem don't cry for me go and cry for yourself and your children i don't want any self pity here sympathy empathy and all those things so what do we show on good friday we try to you know cook up or manufacture some of these feelings within us and look at the cross and say how he died how he died now that is because we have a kind of post resurrected idea of the cross you see cross and interpretation of the cross so we our uh, outlook or the concept is that it is a mixture mixture of history tradition and also uh, scripture and experience and experience now did the disciple understand this not that did the disciple understand the cross how many disciples were there at the cross come on come on good friday you have to have all the memories of sunday school how many disciples were there at the cross only one john then what happened to others then how can you say that there are eye witnesses you understand here none of the disciples were there to be eye witness of jesus christ 
dying on the cross. But today, we behave as if we are eyewitnesses. You see, all kinds of feelings we have. None of them, they ran away, scattered. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That's what happened before. You know, Jesus went to the cross. Please turn with me to Luke chapter 18. In Luke chapter 18, there was 31. 31. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, note that this is, this is just about 10 days, 8 or 10 days before Jesus went to the cross. Do you understand? Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. What did Jesus say? Just now, Reverend Wilbert said how Jesus had to fulfill the scripture and so on. Now, this is about 10 days before I'm talking about. What did Jesus say? He took the 12, very plainly told them, this is what is going to happen to the Son of Man. And where are they? They are going up to Jerusalem. Jesus has already set his face towards Jerusalem. And he travels from uh, uh, Galilee, Galilee via Samaria, then Samaria to uh, Bethany, and Bethany to Bethpage, Bethpage to Jerusalem. That is our route he traveled by the time we come to the cross. Now he is telling, before he started the journey in Galilee, he says that everything, not that everything that is written uh, by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. And that is what Jesus said. He told the disciples. But where are they at the cross when he said this? They are not there. The question is, did they understand this? Did, they under did the disciples understand this when Jesus spoke to them? It is not the first time Jesus is speaking. Half a dozen times in one and a half years. See, the time that he started uh, speaking plainly is one and a half years. One and a half years, half a dozen times he has said, you know, what the Son of Man is going to do on to the cross. And we are up to Jerusalem. We are going up to Jerusalem. Did they understand? No. None of the disciples understand, including John who was standing there on the cross. And uh, all the four gospel writers say that they did not understand. What do we understand on the on a Good Friday? That means we are smarter than those disciples. Am I right? Oh, look at the next verse. Verse 34. The disciples did not understand any of this. Yes? Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. What a strange uh, thing, you know. Jesus very plainly says that. But they did not understand. Now that's why we need to note that when we look at, look back towards the history and try to understand what is in the gospel and how we put ourselves into it, there's a lot of difference. A lot of difference. And sometimes tradition overtakes the history. You understand? And our own subjective experience overtakes history and the history disappears. And we only have a tradition to follow. You see that? And that happened to the disciples as well. So the, what is the meaning of this? Jesus was always conscious in his life. As we noted here, he focused upon the fulfillment of the scripture. By the way, the word fulfilled there, it is the same uh, Greek word that is used, accomplished. You understand? It should be accomplished. Just like it is finished, so also the same word that is used here. It will be accomplished or it will be finished or it will be complete. So there is a conscious affirmation on the part of Jesus always. He has been sent by God. Note that. He has been sent by God, appointed by God, assigned the task to fulfill. All these things are true. You know, they are all loaded with references. He was appointed, assigned, and also he was very conscious uh, that he was sent by God. Constantly he said that, my father has sent me, I did not come on my own. Not that. 
I did not come on my own. My father has sent me and so on that I have a mission to fulfill. So therefore, scripture must be uh, fulfilled. In Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Luke 24, 44. And this is now, you see, after resurrection. Jesus is reminding the disciples after the resurrection in 24 and 44. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Uh, where we went to look, understand. In Luke, he said that. And the number of times, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. In other words, the whole Old Testament is given there. Everything is written, had to be fulfilled. I am not here only because of history. Now what does it mean? Jesus was not there 2000 years ago because to fulfill the history. It is beyond, beyond the history. Why? God has already predicted what is going to happen. You remember uh, uh, the, in the scripture that when, when was Jesus uh, crucified? When was Jesus crucified? You are all on Good Friday, you don't know. What is the date today? Not the day, do date. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> when did Jesus die? When was he born? Huh? Are Baba, you don't know the you all celebrate Christmas. 25th December, correct? Let us say 25th December. December 25th will never change. Am I right? Never change. Christmas is Christmas. When it comes to the death of Jesus Christ, sometimes you have in March and sometimes you have in April. Why? How is that the day change? Huh? You don't know, last year it was April and this year it was March and all those things. Why is it a change? That's why you don't know when he died. You understand? When did he die? You say 2000 years ago. No. The scripture says beyond that. When was the lamb slain? The lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Ah, when was this? Not Good Friday. The Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Before the world was created. Before you and me were created. Before the time was created. The Lamb was already slain in the plan of God. That is why scripture has to fulfill. That's why we are not dealing with the pure history. We are dealing with his story. Which began before the time. Before the time. And that's why, don't you ever think 2000 years ago Jesus died? No. That is history. When did Jesus die and it became an experience to you? If Jesus died 2000 years ago, when was this your experience? That depends upon when you accepted it. You see the time factors? Before the foundation of the world, 2000 years ago the history and my experience of what God has done in Jesus Christ will become my history. You understand? My history. And did the disciples understand all these things? No. They never understood these things. And that is why when we come to John chapter 19, note that. In, John, in Luke we noted that he started from Jerusalem and then in uh, Luke chapter 18. Yeah, eight, uh, Luke chapter 18 was 31. There also we see the same thing. Uh, 8 to 31. We re uh, read that. And John chapter 19 was 28. We said, when, the, when, in, when he knows and conscious of that scripture he is fulfilled. That is on the cross. That is on the cross. So all the time in Jesus' ministry, he was looking at that. So what was he looking for? Only one word that is used in all these things, it is his death. Doesn't matter how it happened, 
but death. So death and dying or giving life, these are the expressions in the New Testament that we see here. And those are the things that is mentioned. And in the epistles and so on, the word sacrifice is used. You know, in the gospel also, ransom is used, sacrifice is used. And the sacrifice is a sacrificial system which God has introduced is the one that he is going to fulfill. What should be the fulfillment of the scripture? I will die. Why do you die? If you ask a Hindu, non-Christian, you know, Jesus died for you. He says, I, I never asked him to die. Why should he die for me? We say, oh, he died for my sin. That's what we say, Christians. But a non-Christian will say, I never asked him to die for me. In other words, he has no idea whatsoever whether death is needed or sin has to be redeemed and so on. So Jesus here uh, came to fulfill that sacrificial system that was established in the Old Testament. In Leviticus chapter 1 onwards, you have all those systems. And in this system, a uh, sacrifice ought to be acceptable sacrifice. I cannot offer anything that I want to. You see, animal should be spotless, blameless, and then no defects at all, and it is approved by the priest, and then only it is accepted. How was Jesus' cross and his sacrifice accepted? Why do we say that he is accepted? In the Old Testament, that is the law. No animal can be sacrificed without these things. In other words, sacrifice in itself is not anything. Even in the Old Testament. You know, there is a dissatisfaction. If you don't know that, turn to Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. There is a thorough dissatisfaction with uh, the sacrifice that we see uh, here. Isaiah chapter 1. And this has to do with... Uh, uh, the way they uh, treated the sacrifice. Well, look at verse 11. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. Now, who gave the system of sacrifice? God only gave. Am I right? Now, what is he telling here? Multitude, multitude of sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings, of rams and the fat, uh, of the fattened animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Look at the dissatisfaction of God. In the Old Testament itself, he expresses saying that, I am not satisfied with this. I am displeased with that. Look at the strong words he uses. When you come and appear before me, who asks you of this trampling of my coats? And then he says, stop bringing meaningless offerings you see that meaningless offerings and then your incense is detestable to me new moon sabbaths and convocation i cannot bear your worthless assemblies your new moon feast and your appointed feast i hate your songs also okay festivals also they have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. What a dissatisfaction. God says, I am not interested in sacrifice. If that is true, then what is Jesus doing on the cross? If God is not satisfied, then what is he doing? Then turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Now this is a commentary on those things that you see in the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at what Jesus also says the same thing. He takes the Old Testament quotation. Five, verse five. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he says, sacrifices and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. With bond offerings and sin offerings, you are not pleased. Then I said, here am I. Return, it is written about me in the scroll, I have come to do your will, O Lord. Now tell me, what is the value of sacrifice, including the cross, including Jesus' suffering? Sacrifice in itself has no meaning. Please note that. Even if you think of Jesus' suffering, 
Jesus suffering on the cross itself has no value unless it is something that is acceptable by God. Now how does God accept this? Because he already said that I am not interested in any of these sacrifices. But what did Jesus say here? Lo, I have come to do your will, O Lord. You have prepared a body for me. I want to fulfill your will in this body. That is where the cross comes. You understand? That is where the cross comes. If I take only the sufferings of Jesus Christ and leave the rest of the statement that is made, I am simply following a tradition of the Good Friday, nothing else. Doesn't matter how much you sit and cry and moan and anything, any feelings that you may show, you know, for Jesus Christ, nothing. We are not to sympathize. We are not to empathize. We are not to cook up the, you know, feelings about Jesus' suffering and so on. Jesus himself says that God does not accept that. What does he accept? Lo, I have come here to do your will, O Lord. In other words, obedience, without obedience, sacrifice is useless. Is useless. Today, when you are sitting here, if you think only the sacrifice will solve the problem, no. We are not saved by the cross of Jesus Christ by sacrifice. Please note that. I look at verse 10. Same chapter, verse 10. Uh, maybe I'll read verse 9. Then he said, here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first and establishes the second. In other words, the Old Testament is gone. The sacrificial system is gone because it is dissatisfied, because it doesn't fulfill God's will. And verse 10, and by that will, note that, and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ. How are we made holy? Not because of the cross. Not because of the sufferings of Christ. It is because of the will to fulfill. Note that. That is the one that made us holy. That is the matter. You know, friends, Jesus suffered only three hours on the cross. Am I right? Huh? Three hours. That's all he suffered. Look at the thieves who suffered. What happened to them? Their legs were broken, correct? Now, normally they keep two or three days on the cross according to Roman system. But Jesus died before that. Jesus' legs were not broken. Then who suffered most? The thieves. Not Jesus. Am I right? How many years the cancer patients suffer? You understand? Years and years and years they suffer. And they only expect, I want to die. That's all. Nothing else. Think of the leprosy patient. They are also suffering. How many years? Throughout their life they suffer. That's why it says suffering is not the one that brings us a salvation. It is the will of God that has been fulfilled, obeyed. Obeyed as he has given. That is the one. Today what God requires from you is not the sympathy, empathy and so on. Do you obey God? Do you obey what has been told and also given through the cross of Jesus Christ? Cross of Jesus Christ. If there is no obedience, all these festivities meaningless in the sight of God. It is meaningless sight of God. That's why Jesus had to say, all these old things have gone. It is finished. What is finished? That old system has been finished. New system has come. Through my obedience, he says, I have introduced this one. On the one hand, it is finished the old system and also the new system also is finished on the cross of Jesus Christ. That is why we have no excuses whatsoever when we look at the cross of Jesus Christ. Why? It is finished. What was finished? The disobedient spirit was removed. It is finished. And the obedient spirit has been given to us. That is the new covenant. You understand here? He came to establish the new covenant. And according to uh, Ezekiel chapter uh, 36 and so on, if you read, I will take away the stony heart. I will give you the heart of flesh 
so that you will keep my word. Now what is he doing? I will take away. Why did he die on the cross? To take away the disobedient spirit within me and I will put my laws into your heart so that you will be able to obey me. If that is not taking place, all these festivities and all these feelings that we have about the cross is nothing but a bogus feeling. It's a bogus feeling. What God wants is that obedience to his son. Obedience to his son. That's why today I can't make an excuse. I can't say I am weak. I cannot do anything. I cannot overcome my head, jealousy, lust, and all those things. No, Jesus says it is finished. You want the victory? I have already won the victory. It is finished. But is it finished in you? No, you are still living. Next year you come back to the same Good Friday. Am I right? That is what the repeatedness has been completed. Jesus said repeatedness is gone. It is finished. Now you come to the obedience and God will show you what it is. The, the obedience will complete and we are not uh, to make any excuses that we have. You know, when Jesus died, he was representing the new humanity. What was the old humanity? In Romans chapter 5 verse 19 you say, Adam represents the old. Adam represents the disobedient spirit. Jesus represents the new humanity. Jesus represents the obedience to the and that is why that old system by which we inherited from Adam, that is gone. It is finished. Adamic nature must finish. Now the new nature in Christ Jesus has come into picture because Jesus said, it is finished. It is finished. What a glorious deliverance that he has you know, brought to us in Jesus Christ. It is a great deliverance when you think of Good Friday. If at all it has to be a Good Friday today, and you want to put a full stop to everything that you are doing against God and against the uh, cross of Jesus Christ, then God says, put a full stop. Because Jesus said, I have put a full stop in the plan of God, in the, uh, in the uh, purpose of God, in order to fulfill that. For you, I have done that. And therefore, when I identify myself in that uh, obedience that Christ has done, that is my righteousness. My righteousness is not what I do. My righteousness is his obedience brought me righteousness. Through one man, obedience came. Through one man, disobedience came. Not that. This is all biblical truth. And that's why we have to identify. Do I identify with Jesus Christ as a new humanity, with a new life, so that I will live victoriously, saying that, put a full stop to everything that I am doing then you don't need to repeat again and again and again. We will lead a victorious life in Jesus Christ. May God help us to see this biblical truth that he has finished and we don't need to continue in sin anymore. Amen. Obedience to the will of God is what God expects from each one of our lives. May God continue to speak to us through the revelation that God has, Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Shall we all rise up and sing hymn 415. We will sing the first and the last stanza and then we will enter the final word. Shall we all rise and sing this hymn 415. Say 
Please be seated. The final word is taken from Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses from 44 to 49. Luke, chapter 23, verse 44. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the woman who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. May God add his blessing to the hearing of his holy word. I now invite Reverend Matthew George to please come forward and speak to us the seventh word on the cross. Let us pray. <clears throat> Loving God, we thank you and praise you, Master, for this blessed afternoon which you have given to us to meditate the words which you have uttered upon the Calvary's cross, O Master. As we have come to the last word which you have uttered on the cross, O Master, Lord, you enrich us, enlighten us, strengthen us with your living presence to understand, apply, and practice your word, O Master. Lord, use me as your humble instrument to proclaim your word with full power and authority and clarity, O Lord Jesus. Submitting and surrendering ourselves once again into your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The seventh word from the cross, a cry of contentment. One of the penalties imposed on man as a result of sin was that he would die. After the exile from the garden, Adam stumbled upon the limb or lifeless form of his son, Abel. He spoke to him, but Abel did not answer. Adam lifted Abel's head, but it fell back limb. His eyes were cold and staring. Then Adam remembered that that was the penalty for sin. It was the first death in the world. Abel's death was first death in the world. Now, the new Abel, Christ, slain by the race of Cain, prepared to go home, his sixth, and his sixth word was earthward, and the seventh word was towards Godward. The sixth word was the farewell to time. The seventh word beginning of his glory. It was a beginning of his glorious eternity as he has promised to each one of us. He now prepared to return to the Father's house and as he did so by saying the perfect prayer and committing himself to his Father's hands, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The portion which was read before us from Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Again, we see Christ's respect for the scripture, for he was quoting Psalm 31, verse 5. Here is the Christ's view of death. He implied that he was giving his life away in a certain hope of finding it again. He was choosing to die purposefully depositing his life in heaven's charge. The word commit meant to placing something valuable in the charge of a friend. 
the bible says that he bowed his head which suggests that resting one's head on a pillow for sleep the cross became god's pillow hence the bernard of clairvaux asks who is he who thus easily falls asleep when he wills what evidence is there that christ's death was voluntary or even intentional let us briefly look into three points on the seventh word firstly his death was voluntary no one has forced jesus to offer himself to upon the calvary's cross he volunteered as a living sacrifice for the redemption of the human kind in his baptism jesus identified himself with the sinners and in his temptation he refused to be deflected or bounced from the ways of the cross he repeatedly predicted his sufferings and death and steadfastly set himself to go to jerusalem to die there his constant use of the word must in relation to his death express not some external compulsion but his own intentional internal resolve to fulfill what had been written of him the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep he said then dropping the metaphor he said i lay down my life no one can take it from me but i lay it down of my own accord john chapter 10 verse 17 and 18 he lays it by his own moreover when the apostles took up in their letters the voluntary nature of jesus death they use the very verb this gospel writers used of is being handed over handed over to death by others the spall could write the son of god loved me and gave himself for me the son of god our lord and savior loved us so he gave himself for all of us galatians chapter 220 we can see that it was perhaps a conscious echo of isaiah 53:12 which says he poured out his life unto death he himself poured out his life unto death paul also used the same verb when he looked behind the voluntary self surrender of the son to the father's surrender to him for example romans chapter 8 32 says he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all he demonstrated the eternal everlasting love through jesus christ suddenly the gloom lifted from the cross and in clear trumpet like tones that seemed to resound throughout the creation jesus christ it is finished father into thy hands i commend my spirit into your hand i commit my spirit a light encircled the cross and the face of the savior shone with a glory like the sun he then bowed his head upon his breast and died amid a awful darkness apparently forsaken of god christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human Oh in those dreadful hours he had relied upon the evidence of his father's acceptance year to four or before this time given him he was acquainted with the character of his father he was fully divine he was fully human to take up the cup of wrath of god upon him to deliver you and me on the cross he understood his justice his mercy and his great love by great love by faith he rested in him whom 
it had ever been his joy to obey and as a submission he committed himself to god the sense of the loss of his father's favor was withdrawn by faith christ was victor and he won the victory over the grave and the death secondly his death was planned everything is planned he is fulfilling the book of moses the law of prophets and also the scriptures he has been fulfilled that's why it is planned on human level judas gave jesus up to the priest who gave him up to pilate who gave him up to the soldiers who crucified him pastor dev kumar was telling were you there at the crucifying site on the divine level father gave him up and he gave him up to die for us as we face the cross then we can say to ourselves both i did it my sin sent him there because of my sins jesus died on the cross and he did it his love took him there because he loved me he went to die on the cross the apostle peter brought the two truths together when he said on the day of pentecost this man was handed over to you by god's deliberate plan and for knowledge and you you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him on the cross acts chapter 2 verse 23 and also acts chapter 4 verse 28 peter thus attributed jesus death simultaneously to the plan of god and to the wickedness of man it's both the plans to get came together in our redemptive plan finally his death was unselfish he did not uh, die a selfish death the beneficial purpose of his death focuses on our reconciliation with our creator god the salvation he died to win for us is times negatively portrayed as forgiveness or deliverance at other times it is positively portrayed as a new or eternal life and peace as a result of his death he is able to confer confer upon us the blessing of marvelous salvation to us but our guilt had to be removed before the gift of salvation and could be bestowed Christ's death and our sins are thus related and what is the link Christ died for our sins death then is related to sin as it is just reward we can compare romans chapter 6 verse 23 as peter says died for sins once for all and for all first peter chapter 3 verse 18 apostle paul also follows with the same so confident pronouncement that christ offered for all time one sacrifice for sins hebrews 9:26 death is the divine judgment on human disobedience if death is the penalty of sin and if jesus had no sin then could he not have gone straight to heaven and escape death no he chose to come back to our world in order to go voluntarily to the cross that's why he became a flesh and dwelt among us john chapter 1:14 we clearly says he became a human like us to suffer death upon the cross voluntarily to redeem us from the bondage of sin and sickness and wickedness he insisted that no one would take his life away from him he would lay it down of his own accord so when the moment of death came it was his own self determined act father he said into your hands i commit 
my spirit is was affirming that jesus christ who being sinless had no need to die died our death the death our sins deserved as horatius bonar expressed it to us i that shed the sacred blood i nailed him to the tree i crucified the christ of god i joined the mockery this was the fact because we all joined even though we are not existed more than 2000 years ago he was crucified but because and he has paid it for once for all for the future humanity too that's why your sin and my sin and my wickedness has taken away by law by our lord and savior jesus christ when we repent and accept him as our lord and savior he promises to be is our loving savior dear friend the seventh word from christ invites us to follow his example whenever anything alarms and distresses us or even in the face of death we can commit it to god in prayer practicing the continual realization of his presence sufficiency and rest in him why should we not be confident when this confident savior is with us and he is our lord and savior jesus has defeated all our foes and now he lives to intercede for us if christ be for us who can be against us a debt of love i owe to jesus he paid the debt i could never pay now now at his cross i bow in adoration and yield my all forever in his way in his power and control may god help each one of us to trust and depend upon him to experience the grace and mercy to continue as his humble disciples to experience the full redemptive plan in each one of our life and also experience the eternity with him let us pray loving father we thank you and praise you lord jesus for speaking to us through your seven words which you have uttered upon the calvary's cross as you suffered a death for our redemption o master lord meaningful insights you brought us through your servants today through the devotions and meditations and reflections o master lord give us grace to accept understand apply these truths in our lives let this not be a routine or a traditional one o master but lord give us grace to be connected to you grow more stronger and stronger and lifting your name on high in and through our lives acknowledging that you are the lord of our lives so master in jesus precious name we pray amen i greet you all in the blessed name of the lord and savior jesus christ that anybody worshiping with us in this worship service for the first time if you are here i request you to stand so that we can recognize and welcome nobody is there i request all of you to stand relax smile and also shake hands with the love of christ Okay thank you kindly be seated
Now I invite uh, Sister Abigail and team to come forward and uh, give us special numbers. The king of the world nailed upon the tree unto death. That's what it took to vanquish and absolve the sins of the world. That's how seriously the Lord views sin. He paid the price. He took our place. Where we were to be hanged, the Lord gave up his only son. That's the magnitude of his love for us. Hallelujah to the Lamb for his indescribable gift unto mankind. Let's reflect on these words as we sing this song. Jesus. 
We've been hearing these three hours of his pain, his cry, his thirst. And what is the take from our side? Even as we heard Chandra say, arise. Let's trade our shame. He has taken our shame. He has traded our shame. The song is a very familiar song. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord. The burden was light at the cross.
all know the song. We'll all do it together at the cross. As we heard the last words say, the last words were point to eternity. He has placed, given us a place in New Jerusalem. That's the last answer we are going to sing. We're all heading to the New Jerusalem. He's prepared a place for you and me. We'll sing the third stanza. behalf of KMC family and pastoral team, I express gratitude and thanks to all the speakers today who, who brought the message of God's love upon the Calvary's cross through seven words uttered by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, all of you. And also I express my, our thanks to choir for bringing uh, beautiful and blessed songs to and brought the message of his love to us. And also, Mr. Abigail and team, the technical team, and all those who helped in various ways for today's service. God bless you all. Announcements, the United Easter Sunrise Service on Easter Sunday on 31st March 2024 at 5 a.m. at Baldwin Girls High School ground, followed by breakfast fellowship. Parking is arranged at the BBMP ground. Kindly take note, Sunday being Easter Sunday, worship service will be at 9 a.m. with 9.30 a.m. with Holy Communion. It is not 9 a.m., it is 9.30 a.m. with Holy Communion. It, the service also live streamed. BBS 2024 is scheduled from 11 to 20 at April 2024. Sunday 21st, April 24 will be the VBS Sunday. Kindly register at VBS Help Desk at CB All by paying rupees 300 per child as a registration. Ms. Anu and Ms. Madhumati Joseph will be there at the Help Desk. You also encourage to contribute generous, generously as the Lord leads you towards the expenses of VBS 2024. Registration, rupees 300 per child, will not be able, sufficient for all to cover all the expenses. We have to spend approximately rupees 1,500 per child for 10 days. We need teachers and volunteers for VBS, so I request those who are having teaching ability and talent to register yourself with the VBS team at CB All. Kindly contact pastors for pastoral visits and home, home, holy communion. 
your prayer concerns can be dropped the prayer box at the entrances and uh, we will uphold you in our prayers kindly drop your offerings tithes even self denial offerings into the offering bags or by scanning the upi code or you can transfer it online to the church account finally after the service kindly collect the uh, buns and juice provided by the church in closing we stand and sing together in number 413 are you able at this time offer will be collected i request uh, mr sharath kumar mr manohar john mr oswald meben mrs anurajan mrs mamta meben and mrs sharmila sharath to come forward and help us in collecting the offer tree they stand and sing together hymn number 413 are you able
let us pray loving father we thank you and praise you lord jesus for loving us with an everlasting love and you demonstrated the same love by sending your only begotten son to this world to die for us and also through his blood you have redeemed us cleansed us sanctified us oh master give us grace to understand the true meaning of your is a redemptive act in each one of our lives and follow his footsteps magnifying your most holy name living as faithful disciples of our lord and savior jesus christ o master submitting and surrendering ourselves thank you lord for this blessed opportunity and privilege and time which you have given to us to spend time in your presence meditating the words which you have uttered upon the calvary's cross o master Lord, as we offer this tithes and offering and self-denial offerings, O Master, Lord, we acknowledge that you are our Lord, Lord of our lives, O Master. Accept this offering and use this offering for your glory and for the expansion of your kingdom, submitting and surrendering ourselves once again into your care. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now may the eternal grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, great love of God and sweet fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.